This is Books and Arts Daily on our I'm Michael Cathcart, and we're talking to Christos Cholkas this morning, who's uh, just produced a collection of short stories written over how long, do you reckon? Uh, look, I was trying to think the earliest story in the collection is, is 20 years now. Okay. And these stories are confronting. I mean, some of the setups are a woman watches a porn video starring her own son who is now dead, or a prison story in which one man stuffs feces into another man's mouth. So, I mean, the listener's going to think, well, what drives anyone to write, well, to focus so steadily on stories that people are in such humiliating and debasing circumstances? Uh, Michael, I would say my first response to, to that question is uh, that I'm assuming a certain trust uh, from a reader that they are uh, not going to be scared, uh, that they are going to trust me as a writer that I am not just doing it for, for exploitation. I should say that the most difficult process really in putting, making it an anthology of my writing was thinking, do I stay honest to, to that early work? Do I rewrite it um, as an older man? And, I th- and certainly there was some editing involved, but I thought, no, I'm, um, even though there's, there's some stories there that I don't recognise myself, um, I don't in them anymore. I'm just like, uh, who is this young man? <laughs> you talked about one of the stories um, is about a woman who has to watch uh, her son's performance in a porn film. Uh, now, that, that's a story, I couldn't tell you how old it is now. It's, it's, it's longer than a decade um, since I wrote it. But it's part of a, a long exploration that I've tried to do through fiction, and that's where I feel really fortunate being a writer of fiction, of trying to understand this complicated relationship I have with something called pornography. You know, that uh, pornography has been part of my life uh, since I was a teenager. You know, pornography is, is everywhere around us now, particularly over the last, um, last two decades because of the, the internet. And I, it came of wanting to, um, to not shy away from trying to explore this complicated thing that is pornography, but also to try and find the humanity within it. You know, there's that line, mm. uh, every woman in a porn film is someone's daughter. And that's, uh, I'd heard that years and years ago. Um, and it came from, from that, that observation, which is almost a cliche now, but I made it a son because every actor, every male yeah. actor in a porn film, they're someone's son. Well, the truth is that if you state the premises of these various stories in a bald way, they all sound gratuitous. But actually when you read them, what happens is that you're taken into this very strange and often very tender and very bruised place. So the story with this woman is that her son has died of an overdose in L.A. He, she and the father fly over, a terrible thing they have to do, fly over to L.A. to collect the body. And the, the policeman or the coroner, whoever it is, the official there says, look, I don't know whether you know this, but your boy was you know, involved in the porn industry. Here. That's right. That's... And so she wants, it's a loving thing actually. She wants to know where her son has been. So I'm asking for a certain trust from a reader that they will uh, believe me when I say it's not merely to shock. What I wanted to do was to say if I can present some of the most ugly things in the world to you, can we find the humanity mm. there? Because but what you find there is the love and the pain that that causes her is what the real the story is really about. It's not about pornography as much as what it costs to love someone so much that you have to bear um, witness to to the unim- unimaginable. And she, you know, I think that's that's what I wanted to write. You referred to another story which was set in a prison. That was me trying to explore what happens. And the, the, the main character in the in the story is someone who doesn't have English as a first language. You know, they're, they're an immigrant locked up in a jail in Australia. What does what is the extreme that racism can take you to you know when when you are treated as the ugly uh, unwanted uh, villainous vile outsider well what happens to that rage so what it explores is the violence between men and also the uh, use of sex as a power thing mm. you know um, homosexual sex or sodomy in prison um, as, a, as a way of brutalizing people and I suppose a way of getting pleasure and sharing intimacy too, I guess. But one of these men has a grievance against another. And in order to stick up for himself, eventually he confronts these guys in the toilets and just, well, he just scoops the poo out of the, out of the toilet and stuffs it in his face. Now, is that coming out of some 
just out of your imagination, are you sitting there thinking, I wonder what it would be like? Could you could people stoop that low? Or did you hear a story about someone doing that in prison? I mean, it just seems like, even for prison, an extreme... If you like, the idea uh, that I wanted to explore was what does the effect of words, of insults, um, do to someone? And then, you know, to, to put it bluntly, shit became a metaphor for 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 those words you know mm. when you are verbally given shit um uh for a year three years for a lifetime well how do you turn that back and that that was what i wanted to explore as a writer i mean words are words are my tool i've, I've said that for years and you know the there's a couple of stories that in the in the collection which are very much about what words can do uh, a, a mother dealing with a son who has made an abusive comment about a fellow student, a woman who is, you know, on a holiday with her husband who hears him say something really racist. I'm interested in how words work. I'm interested in how we are fearful of words. I'm interested in how we police words. I'm interested in those moments, and those are the moments of drama, you know, mm. those are the moments of fiction, when our guard is down or we make that mistake or yes. we... Uh, say something ugly. How do we come back from that? So the book, the collection is called Merciless Gods, and uh, the opening story is called Merciless Gods. That's the title story, which is about words. Actually, it's about a group of people who get together, and they're 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 all from they're all wog kids basically yeah. who've made good. It's we're back no, in... not not completely. It's a, it, they're 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 a group of people who uh, knew each other from university. They are part of. Uh, an elite, very smart, very sophisticated set. Yes, uh, some of them are from uh, different... Oh, they're all from different kind yeah, of ethnic backgrounds. That, that's right. But yeah. it, we're back in Barracuda territory, yeah, really. Yeah. It's about the kids who've crossed the river and you know done well and Ooh. gone to uni and so on. Anyway, they get together in a swanky apartment and they play a word game in which you have to put... Uh, Keywords into a into a bowl and then pull pull one out and everyone has to tell a story and the word that's been pulled out is revenge, and each person <laughs> tells a story about revenge that's more appalling than the previous one. Um, just take us through this. I mean, tell us what you don't give the story away. Oh, of course, I, I, it's interesting that you said that. Um, you know, in some ways, there's a connection to Barracuda because I think what what happens in for me with short fiction, I think I have a more immediate ability with a novel, you know, I think in terms of the novel. So the short story is something that I've had to work on uh, through the years. I've had to really uh, learn that, that, that craft. And so when it came to Merciless Gods, partly because it came, it was written in between the slap and Barracuda, where I think class, um, you know, the middle class world of, world of the slap, the working class uh, world that begins Barracuda, I was just trying to think of who are these people um, what do I want to say about class? What do I want to say about my own experience of class coming through the uni you know through university and suddenly finding myself in a very 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 different world to the one I grew up in? And I just remembered a period post university where there you know that people would play these kind of games. They would be games using words, and you know in a way you've got that's the most innocent of situations. We're playing a games. We're playing a game, but it became a competition. Most often it became a competition about proving who was the smartest or who was the most knowledgeable, who was the better storyteller. And I thought, why don't I take that logic and just push it a little bit further? You know, so I use the metaphor of the game to explore these uh, real tensions and jealousies and envies between these people. So this sensitivity, this alertness to class that you've got, Christos, is this... Um, is this what's going on? Are you trying to show the comfortable middle class world, who I guess are the majority of your readers, that there is another world which is tougher than they could ever imagine? Look, Michael, you because you you know we've we've talked about this before. I think there's something really for me, and I can only speak for myself as a writer. There's a certain position where I got to where I think there's a selfishness about what we do. The only reader I really want to place is myself. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, that, that I think you get yourself caught into uh, particular binds and trouble as a writer if you are trying to second-guess an audience. Because once you start second-guessing, you're, um, you're actually, the audience becomes a lazier audience or a lazier reader than the, the, the reader you want. It becomes a, a more comfortable reader. Um, and so, I, yeah, I am selfish. I wasn't trying to assume anything about the audience. Yes, I realise that the majority of the people who, who will read my fiction will come from a, a middle-class world. 
but I'm also don't want to forget um, that there are also people outside that world who will come across books, and that's that's just as important to to keep in mind. And I, I think of myself: how did I begin as a writer? I began as a writer, as a reader. You know, whenever I talk to creative writing students, that's what I that's the most important point to make is that that we are readers. Where I was fortunate was that I had a couple of great teachers who understood that I loved reading, understood that I was reading uh, way more uh, sophisticated uh, fiction than was part of the school curriculum, and who trusted my love for reading, but they gave me material that was hard, you know, that gave me material that probably these days would get them in trouble. But I'm so very grateful for for that experience. You know, I read this book over the weekend and I read a review of it before I started, so I knew what all these stories were going to be about. And I, I thought, oh, I don't want to read this kind of grim thing. I want a weekend that can be a bit light. <laughs> uh, but it was a joy. It was a total joy because you, you have taken us into a place of incredible humanity where people are doing the most appalling things. You know, there's a man who has to care for his father in an intimate and pretty humiliating way. And he performs an act of, what is in the end, an act of love that you would think would be unimaginable. What I will say is the tenderness comes from my, you know, what's always anchored my work is uh, an obsession with family and no one listening. We're all from families and no matter how much we love them, we also know how dark and difficult and complex and hard families can be. But that, you know, if you're lucky, there's always a, that, that, that yearning for, for love and some kind of resolution. And I think I'm as much as a writer can be a critic of their own work, and I actually think that's impossible, I hope that that's in the stories. Christos, thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Christos Chalkless. The book is called Merciless Gods. It's published by Alan Ananwan, and it is a work of gobsmacking profanity which yields to the most elegant humanity. You will enjoy it, I'm sure. This is Books Nuts Daily on RN. I'm Michael Cathcart.